Welcome to this presentation on post-stroke complication spasticity management. I am Xuan, a rehabilitation physician from Tan Tock Seng Hospital, and I have with me Chen Wu, a senior occupational therapist from Bright Vision Hospital. The objectives of this presentation are as follow: to understand post-stroke spasticity and appreciate its effects on patients with stroke. We will also touch a bit on the management of post-stroke spasticity. To start off, let us understand what spasticity is. Classically, as defined by Lance in 1980, spasticity is characterized by a velocity-dependent increase in tonic stretch reflex. And clinically, it is seen as a quick and short-lasting resistance felt when an afflicted extremity is moved quickly. The faster the stretch, the greater the resistance. Stroke patients with spasticity may present with complaints of muscle tightness, stiffness, and or ability to control their muscles. This will usually prompt the clinician to conduct a thorough examination of the patient, at which point the diagnosis of post-stroke spasticity will be made. Spasticity is caused by an imbalance of signals from central nervous system to the muscles, and this results from an insult to the central nervous system or motor neurons. Spasticity is found in a myriad of conditions, of which stroke is one. The prevalence of post-stroke spasticity is esti estimated at about 30 to 40 percent. It is found more prevalent in the chronic phase of a stroke, but it can present itself within the first few weeks after stroke onset. Spasticity can result in a number of complications and ill effects. It can interfere with a patient's function, such as ambulation, transfer, and even bowel, bladder functioning, and sexual activity. Nursing care can be compromised, thereby increasing the care burden of the patient. It can also interfere with hygiene, particularly the perineal and axillary regions, when excess is limited by spasticity. Other than that, it may cause discomfort, pain, and disfigurement. And these may have an emotional impact relating to mood, self-image, and motivation, coupled with the possibility of restricted community mobility and social isolation. Psychosocial issues may arise, and bony complications may also occur. But it must not be forgotten that spasticity can also be useful, such as helping the patient to stand, walk, or transfer when concomitant weakness would not otherwise have permitted such activities. Hence, the decision to treat post-stroke spasticity has to take into consideration these issues. It is important that management is always patient and function-focused, rather than aiming at spasticity reduction per se. Goal setting is important as part of spasticity management. Patient, carers, and responsible clinicians and healthcare professionals should actively participate in the act of goal setting. Using a tool such as the Goal Attainment Scale or GAS can help in organizing, clarifying, and focusing the treatment. Once it is decided that the ill effects are overriding and there is a recognized benefit to the treatment of the spasticity, it is important to assess and record specific measures of the spasticity and its effects. Scales to measure the spasticity severity, such as the modified Ashworth scale and Tardew scale, and those measuring activity limitation, such as the functional independence measure, are probably more useful in a clinical setting. This pre- and post-intervention comparison will be helpful in determining that if the treatment is successful. Prior to instituting treatment, it is good to assess for triggering or aggravating factors for the presenting spasticity. This is especially in situations when the spasticity has stabilized, but took a turn for the worse. Often, attention to relieving these factors will serve to lessen the spasticity without the need for instituting spasticity-specific treatment. And here is a simple algorithm by Thomson et al., which serves to illustrate how a person with spasticity should be assessed for treatment needs. 
Next, let us go on to treatment strategies for post-stroke spasticity. Spasticity management can be broadly categorized into non-pharmacological treatment and pharmacological treatment. It is well recognized that spasticity after stroke may affect motor and functional performance, causing pain and leading to secondary complications. Physical therapy and conventional autosis are the mainstay of spasticity management during acute phase. Initial treatment may start with physio or occupational therapist. Therapists perform stretches and teach the client on self-stretch and range of motion exercises. This type of treatment are more directed at improved mobility and prevent contracture rather than treating spasticity. Casting is a technique of which you can provide prolonged muscle stretching in both upper and lower limbs. It consists of immobilizing the affected limb in a predetermined position by the means of molded casts, and during casting, the entire limb is covered. Alternative to casting, Spleen and braces may be prescribed. It is also known as half cast as it provides less support, but they are easier to use and can be adjusted. Velcro straps make it easier for the client or healthcare provider to put it on and take it off. Regardless of the spleen use, it should be always be used properly as a poorly fitted spleen would cause more problems than good. In recent decades, Rehab treatment using a robot has been developed to reproduce accurate motion repeatedly with less input of physical effort and time by therapists, and studies have shown improvement in both motor ability and muscle strength. Game programs included in robotic device have also positive effect as they stimulate the patient's internal competitive spirits and satisfy their desire for interactions, thereby encouraging their will for treatment. The game programs induce pleasure and interest in the rehab therapy, thus promoting motor learning. Constraint-induced therapy is a form of rehab technique that improves upper extremity function in stroke and other central nervous system by increasing the use of the affected upper limb through restraining the unaffected side. The patients noted sustained improvements not only stable after months after completion of therapy, but also translate well to improvement of everyday functional tasks. Physical modalities such as functional electrical stimulation is a treatment that stimulates nerve by sending electrical current through the skin while monitoring the muscle activity. The stimulation is often carried out over a period of time at specific time intervals. In a study carried out by Norman et al. in 2009, showed that a direct application of vibratory stimuli to the spastic muscle of the hand, forearm of stroke patient, had an improvement in their muscle tone, electromyography, and motor functions parameters after treatment. Thermal therapy had reported to a decrease in muscle tone, reduced muscle spasm, and increased the pain threshold in patients with muscle hypertonia. Pharmacological treatment Pharmacological treatment can affect the central nervous system or peripheral muscles to reduce spasticity and can be given by oral or injectable forms. The dosage and form is dependent on the patient's disabling symptoms and the tolerability of adverse effect, and it usually begins with the least invasive form. Injectables are locally administered, targeting a specific nerve or muscle. Phenol and alcohol can assist to reduce spasticity by chemical neurolysis with possible adverse effects such as pain and swelling at the injection site. Compared to phenol and alcohol, intramuscular Botox inhibits selective muscle contracture without other undesirable general weakness and sedation. The effect of this injection is reversible with about 3 to 4 months. Surgical treatments Clients who are surgical candidates should undergo a thorough investigation, which would include the skeletal growth and post-operative complications, 
while the rest of the treatment have failed to benefit the client. Surgical procedure can be broadly divided into two categories. One, procedure that interfere with the neural pathway and two, procedure that correct muscular skeletal deformities. Surgical removal of the peripheral nerve is usually used for patients where conservative antispasticity treatment have failed, where sectioning of tendons and muscle are directed for patients with persistent deformity. In conclusion, successful management of spasticity can be a therapeutic challenge. The client should be thoroughly assessed. The goal of treatment is a common agreement between the practitioner and the client, and a comprehensive treatment is initiated. A multidisciplinary approach is recommended as careful and continual evaluation is required to establish the most proper approach. When selecting a medical therapy, the adverse effect of the treatment needs to be considered together with the treatment efficacy and applicability to the client's particular pattern of spasticity. Tangible benefits are often achieved by matching the right treatment to the right patient, which can potentially improve their life and the caregivers. Here are the references. Thank you.